agriculture. It's the economic engine that drives this region. On this episode of Valley's Gold, we're traveling to the Central Coast to learn about California's official state vegetable, the artichoke. From field to fork, we'll learn what it takes to grow and prepare this unusual crop. So join me, Ryan Jacobson, as we peel open the petals and get to the heart of this industry. Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production funding for Valley's Gold is provided by... Everyone enjoys getting together to laugh, to talk, and mostly to eat. It sounds so simple, but the reality is that it takes a lot of hard work to feed us. The next time you sit down to eat, remember to thank our farmers Gar Tutelian Incorporated since 1949 at 800-696-6108. The Myers Water Bank and Wildlife Project, a water resource and education program, providing an educational experience that teaches students in the Central Valley about water and wildlife. For more than 60 years, Brandt has been a major supplier of agricultural specialty products. Formerly Monterey Ag Resources, Brandt provides sustainable solutions for both conventional and organic growers. Brandt, we're proud to call the Valley home. I'm beginning our journey near Castroville, the artichoke capital of the world. With me I have Dale Huss, Vice President of Artichoke Production for Ocean Mist Farms. Dale, thanks for joining me. Sure, Ryan. My well, pleasure. Well, let me begin with, tell me a little bit about Ocean Mist Farms. Well, Ocean Mist Farms is a company that's been in existence since 1924. It consists of five families, and it's continued to grow. We're the largest artichoke grower in the world. And, uh, and how much more fun is that? Exactly. I mean, I mean it's, here you are right in the middle of, of uh, artichoke central when it comes to artichoke production in California. Absolutely. And like I said, there's a reason I'm here between Castroville and Salinas is because this is artichoke central. What makes this region so prime for artichokes? Uh, there, there's a couple of reasons, uh, but a, a lot of it depends, you know, is because of the climate. If, if you go to uh, the Central Valley of California and uh, you're in the middle of July, it's 105 degrees. Yeah. If you're here, the, the middle of July, it might be 60. Yeah. Artichokes don't like it cold and they don't like it too hot. And so we have a very temperate Mediterranean type climate here where it's, it's dry, it's, it's not usually too wet, and, uh, and the temper is just perfect for growing artichokes. Okay. And this is a thistle, I guess, in the sunflower family? Yes, it's part of the thistle tribe of plants. And that's, uh, you'll even see signs here around Castro where you, where you hear things uh, referred to as the edible thistle. <laughs> and then that's, that's why, because the artichoke is an edible thistle. And, and this, this particular flower head, the artichoke is the flower of the artichoke plant. Okay. And that's one of the things a lot of people don't know. They call it the fruit. They call it the, you know, the, it's, it's the vegetable part of the plant. But really, it's the flower of the plant. When you see an artichoke like the one here in front of me, this big, beautiful artichoke, uh, what you really see is an immature flower head of the artichoke plant. And so each of the, what are some people refer to as bracts, are actually the petals of the flower. Okay. And if you were to leave this artichoke stay on the plant long enough, eventually the petals would open and you would see a very pretty 
purple, white, or red fluorescence. I've seen all different. This artichoke here, this uh, primary bud, and if, if you look at this plant, I took the primary bud off, but around the primary bud are anywhere from two to four secondary buds, and then around the secondary buds, we, we get the, the smaller artichokes, a lot of people refer to as a cannery. And uh, each of the artichokes, the size is determined by where it is in the plant, the size of the stem, and, uh, and when it comes off, it. and okay. so it just continues. I've seen, I've seen artichokes, depending on the time of year and where they're grown, uh, I've seen uh, artichoke plants with as many as 50 different artichoke buds in them. And wow. that's, that's pretty exciting for yeah. an artichoke grower. Yeah, absolutely, I mean, absolutely. I, I, get all, I get all fired up about yeah. that. So, um, is there, and we're looking at this gorgeous uh, display here, is, is there terminologies we should know when we look at this? I mean, these are actually just leaves, that's what well, we were... Well, they're not leaves, they're actually, of course, uh, I, I guess a botanist would refer to them as a, uh, that would have something that started out as a leaf, but actually, it's actually a petal. This is the okay. petal of the flower. Okay. And so, if you take the, uh, the stalk, and oh, by the way, a lot of people don't realize, but you can actually eat the stalk of the artichoke. And like I say, I always leave just enough here to fit into the pan that I'm cooking them in. I like to steam them Yeah. upside down. But look at this. this, this nice big wide base here. This is really what you're looking for if you're a connoisseur of artichokes. And you want an artichoke that when, when you grab it, it's turgid to the feel, so that uh, it's, not, it's not been on the shelf too long. You want it, something that's really fresh. And then this artichoke, and take a look at this, Ryan. Take wow. a look at the, take a look at the heart in this artichoke, how white it is. And this is all meat right here. That's good meat, yeah. And so, of course, here, as somebody who is going to peel this off, because this is the, the feathery part, or the, or not, the fuzzy part. Not good part, for any consumption there, It's yeah. not something you want to eat, but you're, you're going to pull all this out. Of course, if it's cooked, it's, it's much easier and, and get all that out. Really, and truly then, the rest of this, I just dropped half my artichoke. The rest of this is all edible. edible. Now, in talking about this flower, and you talked about the seed development, let's when we get the production side of things. How do you start a baby artichoke? Um, Are they you know, transplants, or do you well, put the seed it, in the ground? That, it's a it's a good question because one of the things that's happening is change. Yeah. I mean, there's there's no way around a change. And if, if you went back to uh, 29 years ago when I started at Ocean Mist Farms, uh, our whole cropping system was a perennial artichoke system. In other words, plants that have been in the ground for anywhere from 15 to 25 years. Wow. Uh, this is actually an annual artichoke field. Our perennial production, um, uh, we have decreased the amount of perennials. It's still, at this time of the year, the best eating artichoke in the world. But I guarantee you, this annual artichoke that I have in my hand is neck and neck with it because yeah. It's got the same blood in it. Now, and, and one fun fact is, you guys are producing artichokes year-round. We produce produce artichokes year-round. It used to be that artichokes were, were just uh, grown here on the Central Coast. But now we actually uh, take and we go to uh, different areas in California and Mexico, depending on the time of the year. Now, the plants we have in front of us here, when were these planted, uh, put in the ground, and then when, and we're just on the borderline of harvest, on the front side of harvest, correct? Yeah, we're just, in this particular block, we're just on the front side of harvest. This field here was planted back in, um, in October. Okay. And, uh, and so it's, uh, you know, been, uh, what, about six months, and we're already in production cycle. And, uh, and so when these plants then are done producing, which will be in about eight weeks, this field, this, this, all this green vegetative material will be uh, turned back into the ground, in the soil, Field will be worked, and then this uh, particular field then will be rotated back into oh, something like cauliflower or Brussels sprouts. And Dale, this plant that you talk about over the next eight weeks being harvested, how tall would we expect this variety to grow? Again, it'll depend on the time of the year, but this, uh, this particular plant here where we're standing will probably be about five feet tall, five and a half feet tall. And when we look at these artichoke plants, what's pest pressures that you worry about? Um, well, there, there's, you know, there's a, uh, our primary pest is the artichoke plume moth. And it's a pest that's actually native to bull thistle that are, oh, okay. that would grow naturally here along the central coast. And the, and the life of the plume moth have actually evolved so that the plume moth cycle actually emulates the cycle of our, of our perennial artichoke crop. And so their life cycles and their numbers rise in the spring okay 
as our crop rises in the spring. Well, Dale, I'm actually headed over now to check out the harvest that's actually going on behind us to see how you harvest these great artichokes. So oh, great. thank you for the information on how to grow these wonderful crops. And thank you, Ryan, for coming. Appreciate it. I've now met up with Serafin Rees, the harvesting manager of Ocean Mist Farms. Serafin, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Well, let's begin with, how'd you get started in the artichoke industry? Uh, basically, the way I got uh, involved was uh, I was working for a different company back in Delano, citrus company, and I uh, had a friend working for Dale Huss, okay. our artichoke production, the vice president of Ocean Mist. He invited me if, if I wanted to apply for a company, so I did apply, and not knowing the commodity, <laughs> But after looking at the commodity, I fell in love with the commodity. Yeah. And ever since 15 years plus, I've been working for Ocean Mist Farms. Oh, That's great. And you actually have a little bit of a different background. You were an ag engineer major, correct? Technology major. Okay. Agricultural engineering technology major from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Okay. I uh, spent about 20 years. Okay. Close. I graduated from there and landed here. Great. Well, you're here. You're the expert when it comes to the harvesting side of these. We've learned about the growing side of it, but you're going to explain how we harvest these crops. It's a little bit different than what I think we're usually used to for a lot of other crops. Correct. Uh, artichokes is a very unique commodity. And uh, like Dale stated earlier, is that um, usually when it's put it on a transplant on the ground, it takes between six to nine months. Okay. Sometimes 200 to 150 days. Everything depends on the varieties climate daylight. For example, this field right here, it was actually the first block planted for this season harvest. Okay. Um, as you guys can see, this field has been harvested multiple times. It's you said almost up to words of 10? 10 times. Wow. And usually a block will last between 12 and 15 times. Uh, as you guys are seeing the plant, the plant of, um, has about 11 different sizes. It has from a small baby down all the way, all the, all the way to a big jumbo size, yeah. 12. It, uh, and you have to be very selective when you're forecasting for sales and marketing because sales and marketing have to really... You've got to match up the harvesting side for what sales and marketing is doing. Correct. Yeah. And, 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 I, and, and I really have to understand the commodity on the areas that we're harvesting, which yeah. is all through the state of California to Mexico. We, we, I really have to know the climate, the grower, yeah. the way they farm because it's so important because every grower farms differently. Yeah. As you guys can see, our, this primary artichoke was harvested many, many weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, you guys can see the secondaries. These secondaries right here, usually this time of the year, they'll grow to a, a big jumbo size artichoke. As the weather gets hotter, uh, it might be a smaller size. Okay. But. I have to be very selective how I, I train the supervisors so they can train the farmers what to harvest for, for our labor. How many commercial sizes are there available for sale approximately? There's, there's 11 sizes. Oh wow, okay. There's 11 sizes uh, and there's an array of style packs that we pack. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of like Costco, Walmart, uh, Kroger, Knob Hills, uh, Rayleigh's, Winko, there's, it's all depending on what our sales give us for orders, but there's a multiple types of you know, uh, sizes that we pack. Basically. Absolutely. And when it comes to the actual harvesting process, it's a little bit different. As, as I said, it's, it's something that you actually are going through, you're walking through the field and bringing them out because obviously because of the size of this crop, there's no tractor or equipment that really gets through this plant at this time. Correct. Um, we usually have a crew of 40 to 50 manpower and the crew goes, as you guys can see the fields. Yeah. They go all the way through. You have a tractor going 360 consistent, making sure labor is, is moving. Uh, we have to be really consistent. And for example, this field, uh, I, I will usually push it six days, but now I have to push it five days because of our labor and weather. Yeah. Weather has changed a lot in the Central Coast. Yeah. Uh, we're trying to make sure that we pack the best quality artichokes for ocean mist. And this field right here, as you guys are seeing, usually it'll, it'll probably take another three picks more and it'll be done. It will be done after that. Done com okay. completely. But usually a field starts with the big jumbo sizes, then the mediums, then the small sizes. Okay. Um, and then um, those individuals, as they go through, they're actually, they're, they're skillfully cutting it with their knife and then they're just tossing it in their 
backpack, is that what it's called? Or Yes, they call it in Spanish a canasta. Okay. And that canasta red uh, basket weights between 80 to 120 pounds. Wow. It's all depending on time of year. During the winter, um, the people, you know, they're, it's raining. There's a lot of water, water inside the artichoke. So, so that wider. artichoke is really dense and really heavy. Yeah. Plus, they have their suits and their boots. You're talking a lot of t another 20 pounds. Yeah. So, so you got to be very physically fit to do this job. Physical fit, and they have to be very selective when they're harvesting artichokes, basically. Yeah. And they will then take it to the end of the field where it's then put on the they're, trailer. They're put on a trailer, yeah. and that trailer with a tractor goes to the harvester, and being tossed to, to the harvester so it could be processed and packed. And what takes place on that harvester? When it's, when it's, what happens when once it gets on that harvester, it gets stacked yeah. and gets dumped to the conveyor belt. And we have 14 packers. And those 14 packers, every two packer is it's an expert on packing two sizes. Okay. So they are really- Being very selective, selective looking for those two. On the sizes that they're packing for that artichoke pack. Okay, okay. And then it just moves down the line and then eventually makes it onto the different pallets that are organized for different purposes. Correct. And then from there, they will head off to the cooler? They're head up to the cooler. We have, Ocean Man's has a four hour cooling period. Okay. They have to, that, that trailer, as soon as it's locked from the last lock, it has so, no more than four, four hours, it has to be in the cooling. Wow, okay. That's the cycle that Ocean Man's. Very quick. And then I know after that, it's probably on a truck pretty quick to a consumer. Correct. And all, that, from that point on, sales takes over and they'll uh, point out where it's supposed to, that commodity is supposed to go. Well, great. Well, the last question I got to ask you, what's your favorite way to enjoy this crop? My, my favorite way is I usually boil it for 20 minutes. I uh, basically cut it in half. And what I do after I boil it for 20 minutes, I uh, put vinegar, oil, oil, a little bit of uh, bacon strips, then I put a... <laughs> Uh, and I barbecue it yeah. for another 15, 20 minutes. And that sounds pretty exotic. That actually sounds really good. <laughs> That's what I enjoy. I might have to go home and try that one. So, well, Seraphin, thank you so much for educating me on the harvesting of this uh, very important crop here on the Central Coast. Not a problem. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I've headed south on Highway 1 and made my way to Pepe's Vesivio in Carmel. And with me, I have Chef Pepe. Chef, thanks for joining me. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And you have a wonderful show, and we welcome you to Carmel by the Sea. <laughs> well, I'm so excited. This is the, actually the first restaurant I've visited out of town. So um, I'm very excited to be here today. Oh, wonderful. And learn a lot more about what you do and how you do it. Well, you're going to have a good time here in Carmel, <laughs> you and your staff. You're going to have a great time. Well, let me begin, Pepe. How did you get involved in the food industry? Well, I grew up when I was 12 years old, started working in one of my uncle's bakeries in Hoboken, New Jersey. So I've been working as a dishwasher, worked as a, a baker, donut fryer, and worked my way up. And always worked at the bakery until I came out to California when I was 21 years old. So you were a Jersey boy that came out to Cali. That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. And looking for the coast, looking for the west coast. How did you make your way to Carmel here? Well, the funny story was I really came out west had an old Volkswagen, little red Volkswagen, came out, I was driving down the coast, I landed in San Francisco, and uh, came out with the car yeah. to San Francisco, and I was driving down the coast, you're not gonna believe this story, <laughs> but I got to the top of the hill up here and I ran out of gas, and I headed down, because it was going downhill, and I discovered Carmel. I had never even heard of Carmel by the sea before. So I ran out of gas, I pulled into town, I said, this is the place for me. This town is magical. We call it a village in the forest by the sea. As you know, the beach is only seven blocks away. We're surrounded by about 29,000 trees in a one square mile a little locale. So it's a wonderful little place. And you made your life here based off of that? I really enjoy it here. Yeah. In Carmel, we have no red lights. We have stop signs. Yeah. Uh, you know, we have a high heel ordinance. You know, yeah. we wear high heels on the street. Clint Eastwood was our mayor at one time, <laughs> yes, so that's not bad. <laughs> and um, there's a lot of quirky little things. We don't have... Um, uh, street lights. Yeah. We don't have houses uh, with numbers on them. Houses have names here. So it's a really interesting little place. And with the restaurant we're here, Vesuvio, what exactly does that mean? Ves Vesuvio. Yeah. Vesuvio is named after Mount Vesuvius okay. in Napoli, the volcano in Mount Vesuvio in Mount Vesuvius in Napoli, which buried Pompeii in 79 AD. 
So my relatives live right around there, underneath okay. the volcano. Okay. So it's a little piece of history for us, for our family. All my grandparents came over on the boat from Napoli at the turn of the last century, wound up in New Jersey, in Hoboken, New Jersey. We actually were very fortunate to go out in the field and see artichokes, but artichokes are actually one of your big specialties here as well. So I'm coming here to learn how to cook those things because when you look at them in the field, pretty thorny looking, pretty much looking like there's not a lot you could do with them, but you do a little bit of magic with them. So the artichoke, you know, before you, you see the artichoke <laughs> here, each one of these leaves have a little point with yeah. a little thistle on top. So we obviously at home, you could maybe don't have to cut them off, but here in the restaurant, we don't want the guests cutting themselves. Yep. And yeah. the guests who maybe are not that fluent in artichoke <laughs> eating, all right? We don't want to hurt exactly. anybody. So right, so each one of these leaves have to be cut off with a pair of scissors, yeah. and we cut the stem off so it can sit on the plate when it's done. Got it, and then you cut off the top there and, and make it all smooth. cut off the top, make it all smooth. And then uh, I think the next thing was uh, the boiling water straight right. from there. It goes right into the salted boiling water. We can put a little, you can put, we sometimes put some chicken stock in there, okay. give a little bit extra flavor. But with the vegan, vegetarian thing today, we kind of don't do that as often as we used to. Some people are always concerned. They think a vegetable should be a vegetable. Yep. Let's not add any animal products to it. And then it takes about a half hour, 35 minutes, submerged in boiling water. We have to put a top on it because the artichokes pop up and float. Yep. All right, yep. so we put a, a top on it and we put a weight on it so they stay under the water. Afterwards, we dish, we, not dish them out, we pull them out and drain them upside down on a cloth so all the water comes out okay. let them cool. And then from there? Then we take them to the grill, spray them with olive oil, and you'll see on the, on the video where we put them on the mesquite grill and we flame them up and we get these little, nice char marks, a little bit of smoke coming through. Absolutely, no, it was gorgeous seeing that, uh, the flames jumping through them in there, and you get that pretty little singe on the leaves there that mm -hmm. I think probably adds a little bit of that flavor. Yeah, a little flavor. And, um, and then you, you, you plated it after that. It was a pretty simplistic process, right. but you plated it, but you got some good stuff to go along with it. Right, and that's a balsamic vinaigrette, which is, uh, you know, Balsamic oil, balsamic vinegar, and olive oil, and a little bit of mustard, and a little bit of Italian herbs blended together, and um, it's a nice light dressing, but very flavorful. And this is a chipotle aioli, which is ground chipotle, a little bit of sun-dried tomatoes, and uh, mayonnaise base, um, a couple little things in there, a little balsamic, just a couple little hints of a few other little things. Uh, blended together and it's just a wonderful smoky flavor to complement the smokiness of the artichoke. Absolutely. Well, I'm gonna give this a taste here. I guess just break off a leaf anywhere we can here. Mm -hmm. the, the more tender pieces it's, in the center. Oh, okay, okay. Yes, it is. You just dip it in here, the sauce. Right. Well, that sauce is incredible. But that really makes it, that makes an incredible flavor on that. How do you make your way down to the heart? You just keep picking the leaves well, off and eventually? Yes, in general, as you pick the leaves off, you make, and you'll make your way down to the, to the heart. I mean, obviously, we'll be eating these. And yeah, enjoy, exactly. And enjoying, enjoying it during the enjoying process Enjoying the there. meat of these leaves. Which is. Well, let me see you eat one. Do you know how to do it? You know how to do it. You're oh, from I, the valley. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Like I said, I love artichoke by themselves, but the, 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 the flavor of the oil that's put on top as well as the sauce is incredible. Well, just in case, so people uh, don't know how to <laughs> properly do an artichoke, really, you know, on this leaf here, you would turn it upside down, yep. and this way your teeth come this way. Get the big piece of chunk, yep, the meat there. Rather than the other way. Yep. Maybe that's an old wives tale, I don't know. <laughs> you know but it I, works, it I works. I don't think there's any rules Ex of eating an artichoke. Exactly, exactly. Like you said, just sort of dig in and enjoy. And then what we would do. Now you have the wonderful heart here. That is the heart of the artichoke right there. Great size, absolutely. Okay. Beautiful, meaty. That's where all the, that's the gold. That, that's yeah, the yep, gold that's right exactly there. it. And that's what, uh... and that's what everybody fights over. <laughs> so nobody leaves the table. <laughs> You know, if you're the first one to leave yep. the table, you don't get the heart, okay? Yeah, exactly. So. I don't want to eat another plain artichoke again. Good this is you. phenomenal. Good for you. Well, Pepe, thank you so much for sharing this incredible recipe. And uh, most importantly, like I said, this is just a magical place to visit here. I encourage everybody to come over and check well, you out here. So. Well, thank you so much and welcome to Carmel. Thanks so much. Thank you.
Production funding for Valley's Gold is provided by... Everyone enjoys getting together to laugh, to talk, and mostly to eat. It sounds so simple, but the reality is that it takes a lot of hard work to feed us. The next time you sit down to eat, remember to thank our farmers, Gar Tutelian Incorporated since 1949 at 800-696-6108. The Myers Water Bank and Wildlife Project, a water resource and education program providing an educational experience that teaches students in the Central Valley about water and wildlife. For more than 60 years, Brandt has been a major supplier of agricultural specialty products. Formerly Monterey Ag Resources, Brandt provides sustainable solutions for both conventional and organic growers. Brandt, we're proud to call the Valley home.